Hello, everybody. Um, I am following up two of my wonderful colleagues, and I think that um, Dr. Danoff uh, covered some of what I'd covered the other day. So you'll allow me to sort of go through this, and in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to try to cover everything that I was um, quite eloquently told to do. Uh, so let's, without further ado. So uh, you've heard about clinical trials. I want to make you aware of the, in, in recent years, the number of clinical trials that involve stem cell therapies. And if you look at North America here in sort of the uh, lighter turquoise, if the pointer works, does it work? No. Um, you can see that really that big part of the cliff is, is occupied in North America. What about active trials in terms of looking at the lung? You can see this was uh, from last week, 5,040 hits under mesenchymal stem cells. I will contrast for you different kinds of stem cells that Dr. Danoff touched on. And last year, there were 493 mesenchymal stem cell-based stem cell trials. So when you're going to talk about those stem cell clinics, those stem cell clinics are trying to use what are called mesenchymal stem cells. But what are the facts? So letters like Dr. Danoff and her colleagues at Hopkins led first to the Regrow Act and ultimately to the 21st Century Cures Act of 2016 that created the designation of regenerative advanced therapy to accelerate the approval of stem cell-based therapies and bypass stringent testing required by the FDA. I know many of you are familiar that this has gone on in Japan. It's been fraught with some controversy of trying to get around the rigorous testing that all of us would believe is necessary to make a therapy really come into practice safely and to make sure it works. Commercial stem cell clinics bypass these regulations. I'm going to talk about how specifically they do that. And they offer stem cell therapies for what George Daly has called a dizzying list of diseases. Anything, anything that ails you can be cured. I wish it was true. They market directly to the patient. You heard very nicely about direct-to-consumer advertising. Watch out. Watch out for those ads that Dr. Danoff pulled off this morning. They actually have chat rooms on them. You can communicate directly with someone who's on there for 24 hours a day. And they'll call you back with a sale. Be careful of that, too. Patients have died, and three others have recently been blinded. That led to what Dr. Danoff showed you as the New York Times, where patients were injected. Three women were injected, both of their eyes at the simultaneously, and they went blind for diseases that they weren't blind for when they started with. So beware. So what's in a name? I think we've covered this pretty well, and I'm just going to touch on the fact that we have different kinds of stem cells. I want to point you to the right side uh, where you see what we're looking at in the lung is not to give hematopoietic stem cells like you heard about bone marrow transplants, but mesenchymal stem cells. So the bone marrow is just rich with all kinds of cells. It's a factory. And we have the ability now to separate out these different kinds of cells. We can grow them. We can characterize them. I'm going to spend a few minutes on characterization because I want you to understand that it's virtually impossible for you to go to a clinic and get your cells taken out in the morning from your body, given back to you in the afternoon, and have any significant number or characterization done. It's just impossible. The process really takes four to six weeks. So what does it mean to be a stem cell? You heard about the fact that these things can differentiate. The two take-home messages today are that they have two main properties. They have the ability to self-renew. They can make more of themselves and the capacity to differentiate. This is really a powerhouse. Think about it. They can make more of the cell types that we might need. They have plasticity. They have the ability to differentiate into specific mature lineages. And this is probably the most important part that we're thinking about with cell-based therapy. It's a dream, right, that you could give a cell that again could make the target cells that you need to fix your organ. It's a dream now. But, but for, I think for many of us, it could be a reality. I think that's an exciting part of what we do. These are the characterization process. Just briefly, I want you to see that there's some numbers at the bottom of these flow charts that are markers that we use. We use positive markers and negative markers to make sure of the cell that we are isolating. We have that ability. It is impossible that these clinics can do this. This is a ton of work. This takes really a very big process. It takes a big lab. It takes a special facility. 
And so you know that if somebody's going to take something out of you in the morning and give it back to you in the afternoon, forget it. It's not happening. This, I think, uh, you, you understand now that we have different types in our marrow. We have the MSC, the mesenchymal stem cell, the IPS cell. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to cast a little bit of concern about these cells right now, but really important that you understand what we can do with these things. These are really powerful tools for us. This is really creating a whole new field for what we're going to be able to do in the future. How about looking at MSC versus IPS, the induced cell? And just so you see, the two columns don't look the same, right? We have a cell that looks different. One looks like a fibroblast. One looks like an embryonic cell. You see the markers. They're not the same. You see that they can differentiate differently. And the most important thing in this chart that's of concern for us right now is that the IPS cell can make tumors. And we don't know how to tell when they can do that or not. And I think that's just a matter of our, a time where we learn how to play with these cells because we have to alter their machinery to make them work. The mesenchymal stem cell, we don't alter at all. These cells come out of the marrow. We, make, we uh, actually let them grow and make more of them up to a certain point. And they don't have immunogenicity. What does that mean? That means like when someone gets a bone marrow transplant, you have to give them medicine so they don't recognize the marrow as foreign, they don't reject it. With mesenchymal stem cells, you don't have to do that. They lack something called major histability complex 2, MHC class 2, which means that they are not recognized as foreign. They are not recognized as foreign if they come from you or if they come from a donor, because one of the properties of these cells is that they don't create that problem for our bodies. It was one of the reasons that led us in Miami to work with a mesenchymal stem cell versus a hematopoietic stem cell, the ones that are used for bone marrow transplant. These have been used in patients with scleroderma. There have been some thoughts about doing it. But for us, it was a very practical concern. Why would I want to take my wonderful uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis patients, immunosuppress them, make them susceptible to more infections, and then give them MSCs. It didn't quite work for me. And so that's how we ended up with the MSC road. Here's the definitions. I'm not going to go through these right now because I think this has been done really well. And just to let you know that there, these are uh, active cell therapy trials looking at both types of stem cells, but really in the lung, we're focused more on the right side. But what this also tells you is what Dr. Danoff told you is that we can get these cells from other places. We can get them from our bone marrow. We can get them from our mouth, from our gingiva. We can get them from our teeth. Dr. Doyle and I were talking about that yesterday, how cool that is, that we can get them out of the pulp of our teeth. We can get them out of our fat, right? We can get them out of adipose tissue. And a lot of the clinics take advantage of that, right? You get liposuction in the morning. What an advantage. Mm. I can just think of that. And you, you take the fat out, you to take it back in some lab, you spin it around and you give it back to the patient. How cool. Doesn't work. As, I, as you now know, and you're armed and dangerous, if you ever see those ads, there's no way they can do it. They're just giving you bobbly gook. So why bone marrow? This is a slide borrowed from my uh, esteemed colleague, Viv Alama, at the University of Michigan, who's worked on um, MSCs and uh, lung transplant. And what this just shows you is, as Dr. Danoff showed you, is these, these guys, as complicated as the disease is, as IPF, look at all the machinery these cells have. So it's a bit of a dream. It accomplishes, I think, what the um, big pharma can't do, is that it has the potential to attack a lot of different pathways, both in innate immunity, what we have inside, and what we adapt to in our communities. When Dr. Danoff shows you all the pollution and how we respond to that, and how we respond uh, with our immune system cells, these, these T cells that you see up there. So it's a complicated diagram, but just shows you the spectrum of what these um, mesenchymal stem cells can do. And this is just addressing the ones from the bone marrow. I don't mean to say that the adipose ones can't do it. They have to be, we, we have to get them from a different source, but they all can do the same kind of thing. You, uh, Dr. Danoff also mentioned allogeneic versus autologous. I'm going to show you some work that we've done that would argue that I think autologous don't work unless we can figure out how to re-engineer them. In other words, the cells in your body are old. It makes sense that maybe they couldn't repair what you had wrong, and so we get them from another donor. And you now understand that you can do that without having to immunosuppress or take any meds. 
So this is just showing the, the increasing number of trials. This is from Laertes Economou from Boston University and Daryl Cotton's group. Looking at the number of trials that are increasing, the dash line is showing you that there's quite a bit going on in terms of um, autologous and uh, allogeneic. And we would really think that the, the way of the future at the moment is to look at allogeneic. It's going to be easier for us, and we'll show you some nice data, to get cells from a young donor. And so in the clinical trials that we've done, the one that's completed, we used male donors age 18 to 26, armed and dangerous with youth. So they work quite well. Uh, mechanisms. I want to spend a few minutes. I know that you've heard a little bit about the um, FDA. I just want you to understand how things get approved and how important it is. We start, sorry about that, we start with the phase one trial, which is safety, which is what we've published. There are no efficacy trials to date with stem cell therapy. Got that? No efficacy trials. So no one can show you, even if they show you some, something in print. I've had patients come with articles from these stem cell clinics. I'm not sure the journal that it's published in, because I've never heard of it, and I can't find it on what I use, which is PubMed. But they come with a paper that's a publication. That's, that's not how we get things published. We go through peer review. We go through doing a robust trial. Um, you have to understand that there are no randomized, double-blind trials in the lung at all, actually, in any organ to date. All we really have is safety. So beware. So we first go through a phase one, which is safety, a phase two, which is the efficacy, does it work or not? That part has a, a randomized double-blind part. You say, why do you have to have randomized double-blind? I mean, if it worked on Joe Smith and Alan over there, why, doesn't it, why can't we do that? We can't do that because we have to test against a blank. We have to make sure that there's really an effect, that it's not just from the blank alone, right, from giving them saline or whatever else, so that we can really do things robustly, honestly, and come to you as patients and to our fellow physicians and say, we think this is going to work. When we think it's going to work, we go to a phase three, which is a very large trial. So for the drugs that have been proved, approved for IPF, this is the process they went through. What's happening now is an attempt to get around this. And so this is the classic way. We look at a rationale. We look at animal studies. Uh, we, we go through peer review. We look at very serious patients to try to see if that would be where we'd want to go. We do clinical trials that include randomized, double-blind. In other words, nobody knows who gets the drug. We're all blinded to it, and then we see if there's an effect, and then we say it's proven. But what's happening now is this, is that there's no rationale. We don't have to do any studies. We just uh, give stuff to patients. As, as Dr. Danoff told you, direct to consumer here. We know it works because so-and-so said it did. We don't have to peer review. We just keep on going. That's really dangerous. And I would caution you about wanting to support that process. Stem cell tourism, I mentioned already that there's just a whole host of things. Everything you can think of has been tried. These clinics are in lovely places. You can go to Mexico, Panama, to the spa. You can actually have a day in the spa before you have your stem cell treatments. I've heard of all kinds of things. They give you travel packages. Watch out. This is how it works. They take, this is a model of liposuction, where they take this stuff out. What's labeled there is SVF. It's called stromal vascular fraction. It's basically a soup from your fat. It's put through this machine. They come up with a few little cells, and then they re-inject it in the back. The problem is, is that we've had patients with IPF now die from what are fat embolism, meaning that they get fat in this material. It goes in their lungs. We have special stains that stain the lungs where we can see that it's just loaded with fat. And so I want you to know that despite trying and yanking the licenses of several of these physicians, they can go to other states and get their license again. And so beware. Be buyer beware. This is just to show you what's, uh, what's offering. So business is offering treatments. I think you understand. It's misleading. Advertisement, misrepresentation, weak, almost no scientific rationale at the clinics. They have no follow-up of the patients. It's just come back whenever or don't come back at all. And absence of regulatory oversight. That's the biggest concern, right? There's no big brother watching to make sure what's happening to patients and what's happening with any data that could be achieved. You might sign a consent form, too. Beware about that. Those are bogus consent forms. They actually make it look like it's a clinical trial 
the, the, the caution is clinicaltrials.gov. Actually, up until probably in the next couple of months, we'll get cleaned up. But clinicaltrials.gov actually has these fake trials on it. You, as the consumer, have no way of knowing that. They're made to look, look like they're just coming from an academic medical center. So stem cell clinics and FDA regulation, I just want to mention, how do, they, how do these clinics get around this that you heard about? They get around it by this wording that's called manipula min minimally manipulated, intended for homologous use and not combined with any other articles. So what's minimally manipulated? They take it out in the morning and they just do an aspirate. That's minimal. The lawyers love this. They've helped them with this so to get around it. And then homologous use is that it's a one-person use. That's exactly what they're doing. That doesn't give it efficacy. That doesn't tell you it's going to work and it doesn't tell you what product you're getting. Status of therapies, uh, there is no lack of organizations, including the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation, that have come out against this. Uh, I need to let you know that some of the people that have published papers against some of this stuff, looking at clinicaltrials.gov, looking at the problems of direct-to-consumer therapy, have been sued by these stem cell clinics. So this is a robust industry out there that's making a lot of money and really taking patients as victims. This is to show you some of what's been done in uh, pulmonary disease uh, up until, it doesn't include the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis stuff, which I'll show you shortly, uh, is looking at acute respiratory distress syndrome. This is really work pioneered by Mike Mathe at the University of California at San Francisco. COPD, one trial done by a company called Osiris. Dan Weiss did this trial. Once again, no efficacy, just safety. A couple of others looking at other sources of the um, mesenchymal stem cells. You see adipose derived there. And trying to use it as a phase one, two. Now, what I want to show you here is you see this Arkansas Heart Hospital and Ageless Regenerative Institute and BioHeart Incorporated. Those are all private businesses. So they're made to look right. If you saw Arkansas Heart Hospital, you'd think that was an academic institution. It is not. These are private institutions. Buyer beware. So this is to show you the results of the human studies. I already mentioned some of these. You can see that there were a couple of other studies done in IPF. Uh, one in Greece, Suvlakis in 2013, Chambers in 2014, and then our publication in 2016. And it's really a limited number. You can see that really the design of the studies, until we did our study, which was a 60-week study, there really hadn't been any long-term safety study done. So I think what I will be able to show you and assure you of, I think, is that we do have safety, but it's in very few patients. It's only in nine patients, so be careful. How do they work? I think that you saw some of this. They're given intravenously. It's a first-pass system where the circulation in our body, the first pass, does come into our lungs. We know from some very nice studies that I'm going to show you that it's a very quick transit through the lungs. Let me take you back a little bit in time now and give credit to the people who did the animal work. Because I think what you'll see is when I show you the chart is that this process of taking it to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis was a long process. But there were some real pioneers. Here's one. This is looking at the bleomycin model that many of you are familiar with, where you give mice bleomycin in a, through their trachea. And with one intertracheal dose, they get a fulminant disease. They get fibrosis by day 14. In young animals, however, which is why I say the animal model has some problems, in young animals, these animals can spontaneously recover. So if you're looking for an effect with a model, that may not be the best to do. This is actually Luis Ortiz, who was the first one to look at MSCs in young mice. Uh, this is now showing you when they had fulminant fibrosis in C, but they were given mesenchymal stem cells. You can compare C to B and see that C does look slightly better. Luis did that in 2003. We went to the FDA in 2012 to be able to get the first in man for IPF. So understand the development of this and the lag time of what went on. Where do the cells go? I mentioned to you that within an hour, that's the green stain. These are dogs lying on their side. Within an hour, it goes into the lung, and within 24 hours, it's in your liver. It travels through a system in your body called the reticular endothelial cell system. We've done recent studies now that really confirm this. 
uh, and suggesting that the cells don't live in your lung. They don't do something called entrapment. They stay there, they drop their product, and they move on through. This is a, a, a table that you don't need to be totally uh, uh, see everything in it, but look at the number of studies that were done. And the most important thing about this is when we use animal studies, we're looking for safety, and we're looking to see if we get any signal of effect. That was true in a whole host of studies. You can see how long they were done. And then we decided that we were going to take this model that was in young mice, and before we would go to the FDA, we were going to fool around with it with old mice. Um, as you know, and as Dr. Danoff showed you, uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is not a disease of young people. This is a disease of men over the age of 50 who are predominantly ex-smokers. And so we took old mice. A 22-month-old male mice is about a 70-year-old guy. And what we did in that study was we treated these mice, we gave them bleomycin-induced uh, disease. And what's cool about the old mouse is it doesn't spontaneously recover. They don't get better. So that's a nice part of the model, right? They're sick, they stay sick. And what we did was we gave them stem cells from a donor mouse that was either very young, like a six-week-old mouse, or another old mouse, another 22 to 24-month-old mouse. And we made stem cells from their fat, and we injected them. And what you can see on the right side at the bottom is that the old cells just really didn't work. They look as bad as the, as the sections above of the bleomycin. So all that purple stuff that you see is bad disease. But take a look at this side now. So we always do a control in the experiment. That's the saline. So the mice don't know the difference, right? They got the dummy stuff. They get saline. And then, some, then other mice got young cells from another donor, not their own but from another donor. And you can see the big difference between the bottom two sections and the right two sections. Lo and behold, the young cells could really work well. And that's how we ended up going to the clinical trial using cells from, a ma from male donors age 18 to 26. So let me talk a little bit in the last few minutes. I've got about 10 more minutes uh, to talk to you about the trial that's been published now in CHESS last year. This was the study design. We used three groups of patients. You can see here on the fifth line down where it says treatment regimen. We gave three patients 20 million cells, three patients 100 million cells, and three patients 200 million cells. And we really based that based on the cardiology literature that had been doing this at this time for about seven to eight years, where those were the dose regimens they had used for cardiovascular disease. We gave it intravenously. As I mentioned to you, it's a long study, 60 weeks. We now have quite a long follow-up on these patients. But please note that it was nine patients, three patients in each group. No one's going to make any conclusions about efficacy based on nine patients. But we can dream. And so when we submitted this, page, this paper, the editors at CHEST asked for us to look at the exploratory endpoints and ask what we thought we might be able to get out if we were going to move on and develop this project. The, the moral of the story here is we've been very successful at moving the project. We've been issued a new IND from the FDA to do a multi-dose study, a very robust study, what's called a phase two, phase three, that one way or the other is going to get us an answer, whether this works or not. But it really, I have to give credit to the editors at CHEST who asked me to dream, because I was very reticent to do that. I was like, no, this is just safety. I don't want to do any of that. But let me show you some of the data. So this is just to show you who the patients were, once again, male patients, fit the description. Uh, they all sort of had the same level of mild to moderate lung function. And what we saw was that we didn't have any problems around the time of giving them the infusions. No treatment, what are called treatment-related adverse events. The most common adverse event was bronchitis. And when we look to look at the dreaming part of what the editors asked us, these are sort of the common things we look at, and in, in certainly for the drugs that we've had approved for IPF, we've looked at decrease in forced vital capacity by greater than or equal 10% of absolute value, decrease in a six-minute walk distance, not the best parameter, but one that's been used by greater than or equal to 50 meters, and a decrease in diffusion capacity by greater than or equal to 15% absolute value. Fortunate for us, this is what we saw. Pa patients were stable. But please let me issue my caution again. Nine patients, this is not definitive. All right, this is dream. So 
Dream data is that they did better than any other pharmaceutical trial had done. Their baseline was really a 3% variation. You can see that the cohorts, if you look at all the patients, there were two deaths outside of the study. These were patients that actually had progression. Um, they did not die related to the, um, to the treatment. And you can look at the last two cohorts with an N of 4, also see that it's stable. And then you can look at the walk distance. You see a little bit of variability, but remember, it's so few patients. But we've used, in the past, a 20-meter improvement. These patients did fairly well over time. You'll notice that the line starts to drop down, right, at 48 to 60 weeks. That was a little bit of a clue that probably one dose would not do the job. As you know, and as I just mentioned, we went for a multi-dose trial when we went back to the FDA for the new trial called Resell. Some of that was because of the hints that we saw in this data. Stability, a little bit of decline. And then if you look at the diffusion capacity, we see similar kinds of data where, you know, the, the, this data looks very stable. You know, it, it looks really great, but we really don't know. So that's what I want you to take home from this, is that we have to do the definitive studies. So the conclusions from the trial, that was the mean change, average below 5% as compared to a greater than 5% decline in all of the trials, the, certainly for the two approved drugs. The DLCO looked like it improved at 24 weeks, the walk distance improved at 36 weeks, and the FVC improved at 48 weeks. But what did that mean? We don't know. But I think the take home is we have to give more than one dose. Uh, that's going to be really the take home, be really a dreaming extrapolation because the FDA really wanted a one dose trial across the board was 100 million cells. And uh, once again, safe. So what direction are we headed? I think Dr. Danoff promised you that I would give you some words of advice about where I think we're going with this and where we want to go with this is that, unfortunately, the anecdotal reports have superseded the hard evidence. Patients have become victims of this industry peddling unproven and experimental treatments. Please don't become a victim. Let us do the work right. Rigorous trials are needed. We're going to do them. We have the support of the FDA. We have the support of the NIH. Safety is established, but not efficacy. And Resell uh, will be the first multi-dose randomized control trial done. We'll have over 326 patients, uh, that's our goal, uh, at uh, 20 sites across the world, hopefully. And uh, patients will receive cells from a master bank so that all the cells they get for that dose will be made from the same bank of donors. So we don't, no longer will be preparing cells for each one when they get their treatment. It will come from the same, and, and that's really nice because it will allow us to compare all those patients, over 100 patients in each group, getting the same source of cells. There's a lot of information we need to know about this. You can see there's a lot of science that really needs to be mastered before we know what's going on here. So just to let you know, as my last slide, and I think I'm concluding on time, uh, estimated 60,000 patients are given these unproven stem cell therapies. You can see across the world, 300 million and uh, 2.4 billion spent every year. So this is a big industry. That should push the government, the NIH, to really get this stuff funded, both the basic science and the clinical trials as we move forward to try to understand this as a potential treatment. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to entertain your questions.